Okay, so in this lecture we discuss the statistical mechanics of DNA uh, uh, to which forces and torques are applied and um, we discuss fluctuations and uh, the concept of twist and writhe and supercoiling. Okay, so the first topic is the fluctuations in the twist. Here we see an animation, a simulation of a free DNA fragment a uh, linear piece of DNA, uh, 100, 150 base pairs. Uh, this is a simulation of a coarse grain model called OxDNA at room temperature. Because uh, the molecule is immersed in a solvent here treated explicitly with Langevin dynamic simulations, it fluctuates, right? So it's uh, spontaneously bent, as shown in this bending fluctuation, but there are also twist fluctuations. All right, so this is uh, uh, animation comes from a simulation done in our group, and this is the paper. Uh, right, so if we want to describe these fluctuations, um, well, the standard model for uh, DNA is the twistable worm like chain, which is described as, as follows it has two parameters. We have already seen this in previous lectures uh, A, which is the bending uh, stiffness and C which is the torsional stiffness omega 1 and omega 2 are bending uh, degrees of freedom and omega 3 is the twist uh, density okay the, in this case it's a model with isotropic bending okay we know that A is about 50 nanometers around 45 to 50 depending on salt concentration and C the accepted value of C is around 100 nanometers okay so um, right. So what we want to discuss here the twist fluctuations. Here it's uh, it's quite easy to see if we discretize this uh, this integral and we split it into uh, segments of length discretization length a. Uh, it's very easy. This is a Gaussian model. So the average of omega three squared or the variance of omega three. It's simply given by one over C. We see it directly here. This is a Gaussian uh, Gaussian distribution. So this describes the local twist fluctuations, the fluctuations in omega three uh, locally. Okay. Um, we can also calculate the what is called the excess twist. We have to remember that here the twist here that we describe in the DNA is uh, the excess twist on top of what is uh, the intrinsic twist density that we call omega, omega zero. Okay, so the total twist for a segment of length L um, is given by the integral of this twist density, uh, excess twist density omega three or the S. Here I take the integral from zero to L, but I could, you know, my model is uh, if the molecule is sufficiently large, I can take it from any two points of, uh, of a length L. It's well, safer perhaps to take it um, far from, the, from one of the two boundaries, okay? So capital L is very large, and I'm looking at the, the I define a twist correlation function, which is the cosine of these two pi, these, these twists, okay, averaged. And uh, actually it's quite simple to show that the dependence of this um, of this quantity on L is exponential and exponentially decays when uh, L goes to uh, becomes very large is exponential uh, and the, there is an exponential decay well actually for all L and uh, there is a characteristic length to C which is uh, which is then defined the twist correlation length so this is uh, a very similar um, definition as what we apply for bending fluctuations. Okay, these are these are very simple calculation, and this concerns uh, a piece of DNA which is uh, freely fluctuating, as we discussed, uh, uh, as we shown in these uh, in these simulations. So uh, we want also to uh, to discuss um, the actually the real topic is uh, the, what what uh, happens when uh, forces and torques are applied to DNA for discussing these these um, situations we have to introduce a few concepts of dna topology okay let's start from this uh, uh, definition of the linking number so let's consider two closed curves okay so for the moment uh, not specifically about dna but let's consider two closed curves okay the linking number is an integer 
that tells uh, it's a kind of measure or of the degree of entanglement of these uh, of these two curves for instance the linking number is zero if these two curves are not entangled so they can separate it and push far apart from each other uh, and um, well it can be here in this example is minus one and this example is, is plus one okay so how do i uh, calculate this linking number given any two curves i have to look at the crossing uh, between the curves okay so I look them as projected on a plane and uh, I count how many crossings there are okay and for every crossing actually there are two different type of crossings and I assign a sign uh, to the crossing this type of crossing I assign a sign minus one and this is I assign a sign plus one for this type of crossing okay so if I follow for instance this curve I see that this the crossing here in this point is precisely crossing of type minus one and here above also it's crossing of type minus one so the linking number is the sum over all the signs of the crossing divided by two so here I have two crossings of types minus one here then I give um, then I get a linking number equal to minus one so two times minus one divided by two is totally it's minus one here I have no crossing, so no doubt linking number is zero. I could have, have an overlapping of these two curves, for instance, if, uh, for instance, let's consider that the blue curve is above of the one, and then I would have seen, well, that one crossing would have been of sign plus one and the other one of minus one, so that would still give a linking number of zero. All right, so this is, this is the, the way I define this, this integer, okay? Any, for any given uh, two uh, given uh, closed curves. This is the way I define it. There is an alternative definition of the linking number that is, can be obtained from the Gauss linking integral and is defined uh, in this, uh, well, seemingly it looks like complicated manner. So what this means is a double integral, and this is how it's explained here. So it's a double integral over closed curves. Here S is, as in previous lecture, is uh, the arc uh, length coordinate that parameterize the curve. Okay, let this red one be the curve gamma. Okay, and the blue one, the curve gamma prime. So what I'm doing is this, this double integral along this S and for uh, any specific pair of point s and s prime i calculate the tangent to the curve the tangent of the other curve so one is unit vector u and the other one is unit vector u prime i take the cross product and i multiply by this other vector which is obtained by this this vector r minus r prime is the distance between the two okay so um right and this is uh, this is actually gives would give exactly the same type of linking number that we have seen that we have defined before it doesn't uh, yeah it can look a bit mysterious at this at this point why is this an integer and um, and why is giving is giving like this one can understand actually this by using uh, the theory of uh, of magnetism and uh, well Re remembering um, Ampere's law and, and Biot-Savart, one can derive, show that this, this is actually an integer, okay? It's not only an integer, but it's also a topological invariant, okay? So we understand w why it is topologically invariant here. What does it mean topologically invariant? That I can modify any of the two curves, I can stretch it, extend it, and uh, you know, change it, the shape of these two curves in space, provided I don't cross um, crossing uh, two, of the two curves is not is not allowed, right? So any kind of topological deformation here would give exactly the same linking number, and this is quite obvious when we look at this definition of crossing. Uh, calculate the linking number with this uh, with this crossing. Uh, it's perhaps less obvious uh, from this uh, in double integral formulation, but at least can be shown that this is, this is exactly the same. So it's also topologically invariant, is the same, uh, is an equivalent definition of the same quantity. So summarizing, what do we see in this slide? Any two given closed curve, 
uh, to an, any of these two uh, closed curves, I can associate an integer, positive or negative, and this is a topological number that measures the degree of entanglement of these two closed curves. Okay, exactly in this way. Right. Okay, now, why is this uh, interesting for our DNA? So, in a, in a DNA molecule, I have naturally two uh, curves, which are the two strands of the double, forming the double helix. Okay, and um, so in this uh, case, I consider closed circular DNA. So, you may have seen typically open long molecules, linear pieces of DNA, but the DNA can also be closed and this is seen also in uh, many uh, biological um, cells, for instance in bacteria the DNA has a circular shape, so it's closing to itself, okay, so I have a circular molecule and for this I take two strands and then I can define the linking number of these two strands, okay. So let's consider a relaxed piece of DNA Let's uh, that has no well, that is assuming the minimal energy conformation. In this relaxed piece of DNA, uh, one has one turn of the double helix uh, every 10.5 base pairs or corresponding to a distance uh, of 3.6 nanometers. So in other words, I have a full turn of the double helix. I go from this point here to this point here is a full turn of the double helix. Um, every 3.6 uh, nanometers, okay? So therefore the linking number, so going from here to here, I have two crossings, they have the same signs, and therefore by um, taking the length of the DNA L and divided by this H, I get the linking number of the DNA, okay? And this would be the linking number of a molecule which is, uh, which is relaxed, like this, that has a minimal energy conformation, okay? Uh, the linking number can be different from this value and typically in uh, biological molecules it's, uh, it's, it will be different and uh, to define the deviation from this, uh, this natural, this relaxed DNA linking number uh, we introduce a quantity which is called sigma and sigma is the difference from the actual linking number of this uh, of a closed circular DNA and and uh, and this um, this reference this relaxed uh, uh, molecule linking number. Okay, divided by LK. Okay, so sigma it's a measure of uh, how much is the deviations from from the, from the relaxed uh, one. So I define here a delta LK, the excess linking number, okay? This excess can be either positive or negative, so sigma can be either positive or negative. Um, if sigma is positive, I call, uh, I, um, I refer to a situation that I call um, over-twisted molecule or under-twisted molecule, okay? so. You know, this sigma, if uh, sigma is equal to zero, of course I have LK is just uh, the relaxed value, so it's, uh, well, it's a natural situation. So if I have sigma slightly positive, it means that the actual linking number of that piece of DNA is higher than LK naught, okay? And um, of course, um, L sigma is equal to, um, to minus one would corresponds to a case where LK is equal to zero, right? And this is a huge uh, underwinding of the molecule. It's a situations where actually LK is equal to zero where there are no crossing. It's like you are totally unwind the molecule and the two strands run parallel to each other without crossing each other. That That is the situation where sigma is uh, minus one. Sigma is equal to one is also a huge uh, linking number. It means that you make a turn of the double helix, not every 3.6 nanometers, but every 1.8 nanometers. So it's uh, it's uh, it's a huge uh, value. So typical value that one finds in biological systems. So in many many uh, um, cases in cells, typically this sigma is slightly negative. Okay, slightly means uh, zero minus zero point zero five could be a realistic value. So it's a five percent uh, slightly underwound. Okay, 
All right, so this is uh, as much as, uh, okay, the linking number, it occurs naturally in a closed uh, circular DNA. And now we can, uh, so what is specific of these two strands is they're always close to each other, okay? So I can consider mathematically the limit where this distance is going to zero. And if I do that, I find uh, that actually this linking number splits into two quantities. One is the twist that we already know, and the other one is the rife. Okay, so what mathematically I do to get this, this theorem is I take the two strands and I assume that the distance between these two strands, this epsilon is going to, um, it's, it's very, very small. Okay, and it's in the limit going to zero. So, so I can I can prove that this uh, Kalgurehanu White Fuller theorem holds. So this topological number, linking number, splits into two quantity. One is the twist, and the other is the right. The twist we know it already is the integral of omega three uh, that we have already seen in the previous slides and in the previous lecture. The right is a new quantity, and the right. This uh, WR is defined as, uh, as again, it's a double integral, and is defined in this way. is actually a double integral, and it looks very much like the definition of uh, linking number given in the previous slides. But there is a difference. First of all, this is a measure how a curve is wrapped into itself. The difference being that compared to the expression of the linking number, we are not talking here about two curves, but the same curve. Okay. So, and what is u? u is when I take the limit of these two um, strands, uh, yeah, you know, going distance going to zero, u can be uh, visualized and thought as the, as the average position. So the position of the one curve that describes the center, the uh, center of the, of the double helix, okay? Right, so there is only one. If I, if you go back to the previous slides and look at the definition of linking number in this, uh, the Gaussian integral, I had an u and u prime, I had an r and r prime. Here I have a double integral, but on the same on the same curve. Okay, that's that's the difference. All right, so. All right, so the linking number. So therefore, this is a central theorem. It splits into twist and right. Okay. And uh, I can write a similar relation for the excess linking number. Normally I talk about excess linking number, delta LK, then here I would have delta twist, and here I would have the rife, okay? And important, what is, uh, what is the rife is a measure on how a curve is wrapped to itself. The linking number uh, measures how two uh, closed curves, how many times they somehow they cross each other. And the right here is uh, it's about the self-crossing of a curve. Okay, so perhaps we understand it a bit better here with this with this example. Okay, and this is an example of a video where I take first a piece of a ribbon, and I study first the case L k equal to zero. And then the case L k is equal to one, which I obtain by turning this and you see I can have the LK equal to one two states either have a twist one and write zero and the last configuration that you see is actually when the twist is transformed into zero and the right is equal to one the right is equal to one here because I have one uh, self-crossing okay and the twist is, is equal to zero in this case you see that the ribbon here is not twisted is actually uh, you know, one faces, uh, the top part is colored um, uh, green, okay, is always on the top side, okay, All right, so perhaps you can show this video again, we start here, this is the first situation, I close it, I close the two green part on the side, this is the first case, linking number equal to zero, twice, twist is zero and right is zero. Then I go into a situations where linking number is two, one, sorry, and here the twist is one and the right is again zero. But I can transform it by keeping this sealed, I can transform it into a state where the twist is zero and the right is one. 
okay so I see that I can partition the linking number one into two two different states okay this is also shown here in this figure uh, slightly more uh, complicated situations here so I have here a circular uh, twistable polymer here that is closed into itself and actually the section of this uh, this one is uh, square squared so if I cut it open it's uh, it's a square se section and the square is such that the top side of this uh, square section is painted in black and the sides are painted in white okay so here if one side is always facing uh, me I see I see all black okay so the first case the case a is the case where LK the linking number is zero okay and the linking number here I can um, think about as the black side that is on top as one strand and uh, the bottom side as the other strand of uh, for instance of, um, of uh, double stranded molecule okay and here the two are running uh, parallel with each other with no twist and no right okay um, I do the same thing that I did here I cut this molecule open and I make now three turns instead of making just one turn I seal it back into itself so the black side with the black side as I did here uh, so I did here in this this in this video the green side with the green side here I sealed the gray and uh, the black with black but by making three turns okay and this is a situation if I still have a a circular molecule okay I impose now a twist in this in this molecule first of all this is a linking number equal to 3 because I have uh, again here I have if I look at the black and the white side on, on the opposite side so I have they cross six times okay so this is a linking number situations where the linking number is uh, is is 3 but actually this can partition so w without topologically changing keeping this uh, this molecule as it is as I as I, as I did here while keeping my hand uh, left hand uh, fixed okay I can change the the, st the status of this this molecule I can go to a configurations where the twist is plus two so there are two turns but uh, at the pen and the, the price I have to pay that I have one crossing and this is right equal to one or twist plus one and right plus two okay or twist zero and right plus three so when the twist is zero actually I see the the whole uh, you know, molecule is fully black because I see the top face of my square right uh, always uh, facing to me so there is no twist but there are there is the right is has gone to plus three okay this LK is always remains as an integer all right but of course I'm showing here the from B C D and E case are uh, four different configurations but uh, you know this twist and right can be actually non integer okay right and this is shown in here in this uh, this is a, a simulation of uh, over twisted uh, molecule okay uh, it's a short it's simulating a short piece of DNA where I impose a linking number equal to one and I start from a circular shape and at some point you see that the molecule fluctuating has the tendency of uh, self-crossing here of course there is uh, like the molecule cannot actually self uh, self cross itself but you know that it's it's arranged itself into into this eight type of shape so we start actually from linking number equal to one and the linking number remains one but at, at the beginning of the simulations I was in a state with a twist also equal to one and uh, actually this is summarized here so this is uh, somehow the movie time that we have seen it here in this simulation this is a Monte Carlo simulation okay <coughs> in my simulation the linking number here is this black line and it's a topological invariant it's constant and equal to one yeah, actually you see some very small fluctuations these are uh, 
a small discretization error in the calculation, okay, but uh, they're very small, and so actually we see that it's nice, and uh, apart from this, this tiny variation, this, this linking number is conserved and it's equal to 1. And at the beginning of my simulations, I prepared the simulations in a circular uh, shape, okay, so this linking number is all going into the twist, okay, and the right is equal to 0 because there are no self-crossings. Okay, as the simulation goes, you see that the while the sum of the two is always constant, they, they can interchange and actually they, they fluctuate. So the twist goes down, okay, goes and fluctuates around the value 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Okay, this is a kind of equilibrium uh, fluctuations. There are quite big fluctuations, and the right goes up. And the fact that the right goes up. I see it in this, so this is the beginning of, uh, of the simulations, okay, and uh, where the twist is, uh, the right is zero at the beginning, and here you see that when I have a kind of, in the projection I see self-crossing, this is a situation where the right is one, the right can even go a bit higher than, than one, and it's not, oh, it's not perfectly one, but it's, uh, it's a bit smaller, okay. So the right is non-integer, and the, and the twist is also a known integer, but this linking number is, to, is a topological. Uh, once I have a, a closed conformation like this, this linking number cannot change. Okay, it's a topological. And, and these two other quantities, they fluctuate. Okay, I can even um, have fluctuations here that where they exchange here. We see situations where the twist somehow stabilizes and fluctuates here, but you know, sometimes I could have fluctuations where I can, can swap the two and depends a little bit on the, on the situation. So here, by just changing the linking number and going to, a, uh, starting from a circular conformation, changing the linking number and imposing linking number one unit plus one, it's already uh, producing this, uh, this quite uh, strong change in the conformation. Actually, this, this is also seen in experiments. These are experiments uh, of bacteria in which um, enzymes are acting and these enzymes can change the linking number of the bacteria, okay? So that uh, the linking number is, um, is changed by bacteria, uh, so by, sorry, enzymes uh, cutting this piece of DNA and uh, doing the same operation that I did by hands in that video, right? Cutting it open and resealing it back while making uh, one full turn of the, of the DNA so that the two are, um, are linked, uh, are linked back, uh, sealed back into each other, okay? And uh, if this linking number increases, at some point you see that uh, it, uh, it partitions, it's, it's the, molecule ch the molecule changes conformation and it goes in the conformation where now I have a writhe. In here I can estimate the writhe of this conformation by looking at how many self-crossing are in this projection. This is a, an electron uh, microscope image, so this, this piece of DNA is immobilized and placed on, the, on a plane. Uh, on a planar substrate from where the electron microscope can can scan the image and uh, and visualize it okay and by increasing sigma remember sigma is uh, proportional to delta lk uh, by increasing sigma i, I get uh, more and more crossings self crossing and i go to a state with a higher and higher rise okay right okay so from here to here i change i the, the molecule is cut open and resealed back into itself, all right? So this situation is called DNA supercoiling, where um, the molecule wraps actually in, uh, into itself, all right? Uh, in, in, in many situations in bacteria, the supercoiling is used actually. It gives uh, much more compact conformations to the, to the to the DNA, right? Compared to this, uh, to this one, this is one of the reasons why molecules su supercoil. Well, this supercoiling can also be induced in uh, in the lab in 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 pieces of linear DNA. Now we're not talking anymore about circular uh, DNA, okay? But this is um, a schematic uh, view of um, of an experiment, 
which is called a uh, magnetic tweezer experiment. In this magnetic tweezer, the DNA is um, attached at the solid surface here and attached to a bead on the other side. And this bead is paramagnetic and I can mm, manipulate this bead with uh, some magnetic field. Okay. There are two possibilities. Either I, if I shift the magnet up, so there is a magnetic force that, uh, that, that pushes the, the beads up. And so, so this is like extending, stretching the DNA, applying a force at the two ends of the DNA. Or by rotation, I can apply a torque to this molecule. And what happens to the DNA if I um, start uh, from a linear molecule, extended linear molecule, right, relaxed, and then I apply a certain number of rotations and a certain number of turns, uh, the bead start, st starts turning, and at some point, actually, the molecule is, is compressed. So the distance between the bead and the surface drops because there is this formation of this uh, supercoiled pile. This, this, this kind of structure here is called the plectonym. Okay. All right. So this is how a magnetic tweezer works. And this is an experiment, magnetic tweezer. Okay. I start with the situations where the turns is zero. So I turn off any magnetic uh, field. I push it away. So the molecule is, I, well, I don't impose any additional torque. I let it relax rotationally, but I, I stretch it with a certain force. The force is zero to piconewton in this, uh, in this experiment. Okay, so imagine um, that your distance between bead and surface has a certain value at zero turns. Okay, I start applying turns uh, in one direction. And uh, what happens here, I see a drop, a decrease in the distance between the bead and the surface. So the distance between the bead and the surface goes down and it goes almost close, very close to zero here. So what happens here is that plectonin forms and uh, more turns this piece becomes longer and longer and this goes down. Okay, this is what you see here at 0 0.2 piconewton. Uh, whether I turn clockwise, I say, or counterclockwise, I, uh, the effect is the same, the curve is symmetric. Okay. If I start from an initial condition at a stretching force of one piconewton, so this is five times bigger, one piconewton, first of all, my distance, my extension from bead to surface at zero turns is higher. Okay. And if I start uh, making turns on one side or on the other side, I see an asymmetric response. And this is... Um, this is a fact that the DNA has an intrinsic, it's not a symmetric uh, molecule. If I turn on one side, I over twist the DNA, and on the other side, I under twist the DNA. So I see the asymmetry here very clearly at, at higher forces. Okay, and um, okay, the response is, uh, is different. Perhaps we'll discuss it uh, on another occasion. And this is five uh, piconewton. Uh, and here is dramatic the difference on one side to the other okay so here at some point I see that the the response here is quite if I'm looking at this side this this extension it does not change so much actually it changed a little bit it's never really flat here it's a bit curved okay up to this point here and then there is this uh, this this dramatic uh, transition so I see that the transition point here from uh, you know from more or less quite uh, flat right to uh, really decrease actually is changing as the force is higher and i increase it more and more i have to apply more turns to see a drop okay to go into the plectonemic phase okay and moreover the slope of this curve these are called the rotation curves the slope of these curves changes at higher forces the slope is smaller at small forces the slope here of this extension versus turns is is higher okay so this is um, this is actually um, something that we have to uh, we, we try to uh, we have to understand and there are simple models to explain this type of, of situation so first of all we have to you know understand the concept of twist 
well, twist uh, right and, and linking number also for a uh, piece of linear DNA, okay? So we are not dealing with circular DNA now in this experiment, and just so on, but we see a piece, we have a piece of linear DNA. So imagine that this is a piece of DNA that is a magnetic tweezer. Here I have a solid surface, and here I have the magnetic bead, okay? There is a stretching force that I uh, assume that this is the direction of the Z. So actually my molecule is, uh, is quite um, uh, strongly oriented uh, along this, uh, this direction, okay? So I'm not discussing here the situations where, uh, yeah, it's uh, immediately supercoils and it forms a coiled uh, uh, plectonym here. But I'm considering first the case where, uh, you know, I'm still in the regime where, uh, you know, the molecule is somehow more stretched and elongated along the Z direction, okay? So let's assume that, okay, therefore that is, uh, that there is enough force and I don't turn too much. So I'm still here in an, in an elongated phase, which looks like this, okay? Um, I can think in these situations of closing this curve and, and, and making it actually uh, virtually a closed curve by uh, closing this at infinity, say, making a straight line on this side and making a straight line on this side and using some kind of periodic boundary condition to wrap it into a closed curve. Once I've done that, I can calculate, actually, I have back closed curve, I can calculate the rife. I can calculate the concept of linking number, and I can um, yeah, I can apply again this uh, Kulgoreano uh, white fuller theorem, right? So I have the partitions. I have uh, done this uh, this uh, closed curve. Okay. So it turns out, therefore, I can I can define in this uh, in this close closing at infinity. I can define the right. It turns out. The calculation of the right as a double integral, it's always working, but it turns out that if, uh, if the curve is, uh, is actually if the, my DNA is, um, is uh, stretched or, uh, you know, it's uh, mostly elongated along the Z direction with some fluctuations, I can actually replace, and this is a theorem due to Fuller, I can replace this double integral actually with a single integral. And the single integral is actually limited between zero and L, and this is the expression. So the expression is now much simpler because I have to deal with uh, uh, somehow a local, uh, well, it's a local uh, quantity. It's not more, uh, not anymore a, a double integral. So it's a much, much easier to handle and to, to yeah, to do some, yeah mathematical calculation. So this, this is the result. This is called the fuller right. And it's a good approximate, well, it's a good uh, expression for the right, from the total right of the molecule, if the molecule is, um, is, uh, is quite stretched. If, of course, starts forming a plectonym to get the right, okay, I, I have to, um, yeah, I have to use the full uh, double integral ex expression, okay? Right, but this is an expression that we are going to use uh, later, the next lectures for uh, for some calculations. Okay, the single integral. This single integral can also be represented. Uh, so this Fuller right using uh, Euler angles. We have seen the Euler angle representation. We have seen the angle theta, phi, and psi. Okay. And, well, it's a simple exercise. I don't do it here in the lecture, uh, but it's a rather simple exercise to show that actually we using this angle representation, the same integral is here, uh, can be written in this, uh, in this form, okay? Phi uh, dot, so dot is the derivative with respect of s and cos uh, one minus cos theta. Okay, where phi, theta, and psi were defined the Euler angles in the previous lecture. Perhaps another remark that I have to say here, if you look at here now the denominator in this expression, it's quite clear from this expression that, you know, that um, if u and, uh, and z become anti-parallel, okay, what happens, okay, so 
if they point, these are unit vector, okay, if they are antiparallel, so that u points in the opposite direction of z, the scalar product is minus 1, and then we get uh, 0 in this uh, uh, denominator. I could lead to, um, to divergences, okay? Uh, this, uh, it's, it's a situation that we don't want to... Uh, to consider, we want, and that's why we are we are dealing with uh, you know with molecules that are mostly elongated here in the in the along the z directions where this looping back does not uh, does not take place. So this fuller right, uh, it's it's an expression for the right for um, straight, more straight and elongated molecules. Okay. So. By the way, from the uh, Euler uh, angle representation of the Fuller right, I can also find uh, uh, an expression for the linking number. Okay, and uh, because I know that the right plus uh, twist is equal to the linking number, I know how to express the twist in terms of Euler angles. Okay, and so there, therefore, I get uh, the excess uh, linking number. Uh, this is a very simple expression in terms of Euler angles: is phi dot plus psi dot, okay? So this is how the linking number uh, looks like. Okay, so we are mostly, we are gonna use this, uh, this expression, and uh, we are considering a piece of linear DNA, which is subject to uh, some stretching force. So there is a fresh stretching force and there is a torque at, applied at the two end. Okay, so the energy of a molecule of a DNA molecule, which it says uh, applied force and applied torque is the twistable warm like chain energy. And then uh, two terms are added. This term we have seen already. The force enters is multiplying the end-to-end -end distance with uh, minus Z. And the torque uh, multiplies the, the linking number, excess linking number by 2 pi, which is the number of turns that two molecules, the excess number of turns that the two molecules, uh, the two, sorry, the two strands of the DNA uh, make going from here to here, right? Uh, okay, so this is, this is our expression. We are going to work with, uh, with this expression to study, to do some statistical mechanics calculations of a DNA molecule under force and torque. Of course, in the situations here where the we are yet far away from the plectonemic phase where the molecule is quite stretched. We can use uh, all this machinery and we can use the fuller right and we can use this definition of, uh, of linking number, okay? Um, okay, so now this, in this slide we uh, study the supercoiling of DNA. So this is a transition into this plectonemic phase and in, in a very, very simple model. It's actually a naive mechanical model of, uh, of DNA. So what I'm considering here is the following situation. And it's a model that neglects any thermal fluctuations. It's just consider this, a straight piece of DNA of length L and where a force is applied at the two ends. Okay, and uh, so mm, of course the molecule, if I just apply a force, doesn't change. I, if I neglect fluctuation, the length is remaining L and mm, nothing changes, okay? So now I assume that in this molecule I applied also a linking number at the two ends. So I take one end and I rotate it with respect. So imagine that you have a bead on one side here and on this is fixed, or you have two beads, and you keep this this molecule. There is no there is no bending fluctuations. So the molecule is always straight, and I rotate the two beads. Okay, so there would be a, a, a linking number. Okay, uh, here an excess linking number through the application to the by applying a rotation of one side with respect to the other. Okay. So in this situation A, I don't have any right contributions. I don't have any kind of self-crossing, okay? And therefore, this is an elongated uh, piece of DNA where all this linking number goes into the twist, okay? Uh, and the right is zero, okay? But there is a situation at which there is a transition at some point while keeping the delta LK fixed, okay? At some point, the system um, 
can eventually go into this. Uh, this is a simple, naive model of what happens in the formation of the plectonin. I imagine, I approximate this plectonin as a piece of straight molecule, and this molecule makes one first loop, and it's coming back on this way, okay? So I hope you can see the 3D image of this molecule, okay? It's going here, it's make one loop, and it's going out this way. So the total length of the molecule is still L, okay? But I have one piece here, the distance between these two points is L minus 2 pi R, and here is a circle of radius R, okay? So actually the energy uh, is, uh, well, I, I, I have an energy for the configuration EA and an energy for the configuration EB, okay? So I'm not giving all the details of the calculations at this point, but for this configuration B, I can estimate quite easily the the uh, the optimal um, radius R. So there is a radius R that gives the given given the force, the applied force. Okay, there is a, a radius R that is optimal here. Okay. If you can understand, if R is too small, there is an enormous curvature here that gives a very high bending, costing bending energy. Okay. But so if it's for the bending, it's more favorable, we have seen, to have a large, uh, large circle here, large uh, circular loop. Okay. Because that costs less. But when you have a large loop, then you're, st uh, you're st shortening your ends, and this costs in stretching energy, okay? So there is an optimal balance. If I just do the calculation in, in the case B, there is an optimal balance. There is an optimal values of R, I call it RC, that is the optimal uh, loop radius, okay? So for the case B, from now on, I'm substituting this value, right? And I always consider these values. This comes from a calculation. So you see A is the bending stiffness okay so this is the this is the the bending stiffness and it comes from the bending energy here and the other one is the you know it's it's a balancing between the force okay and the bending uh, that one has to pay and this is the optimal radius all right okay this is a simple calculation one can do by putting this uh, by analyzing the minimal value that this energy of this configuration takes given the, the radius and one can say okay once I have found this radius I can ask what is the value of the linking number that gives me equal energies between this and this case okay so I write the energy of this configuration which is a straight twisted rod so in these configurations, I don't have any bending that I pay. I just pay twist energy and uh, uh, the energy of the stretching. Okay. Here I have energy of the stretching, so I pay uh, a bit more energy. And I'm going, because the delta LK is fixed, here I am on the case where the twist is uh, fixed to some value and the right is zero. Here I'm going to a situation where there is one self-crossing, so the right jumps to one and the twist uh, decreases, right? Because the sum of the two has to be fixed in these two cases, okay? And I'm asking at which uh, linking number, delta LK, and I define that as delta LK critical, uh, is the value that gives the generate energy. So the same energy here and here. So what happens here is that for uh, linking number smaller than this critical linking number, the system likes to stay in the state A. This, this we find that this will have lower energy. When I reach exactly this linking number, these two have the same energy. And when I go above this linking number, then this one will have always lower energy. Okay. And uh, if I do the calculation, I'm asking at which values of delta LK these two have equal energy, this is the result. Okay. Again, there is a force, okay. 
and there is A and now there is also C right because there is a twist energy here when I do I compare the two right one is uh, twist is um, delta as a, as a given value and here is a twist minus one so there is a twist difference in, uh, in the difference in the twist energy in the two, these two cases so the calculation is is not so complicated it's rather simple and this is a point where I have a buckling transitions okay so the buckling transition is this uh, transition into supercoil state my very naive model of supercoil is that the plectonym is just uh, one uh, circular loop on this case okay and so the model uh, predicts that the an extension okay if I go and I use the model further okay I can go and I increase the the linking number I, I reach the critical linking number okay so I repeat at low linking numbers Delta LK is small this is the favorite state the state is elongated okay at higher uh, linking number at some point I reach the critical linking number the two states are degenerate they have the same energy and for a larger value of Delta LK this state will have lower energy but the more linking number I give the in, in this model I assume that there is another loop on top of this and another loop and another loop so for any increase of linking number of one I would have actually my in my picture my plectonym will be made by circular loops on top of each other okay and um, so this this is a very simple model and this model predicts some very simple uh, power law behavior so for instance uh, this model would predict that actually the length here when the linking number delta lk or uh, it's proportional to the number of turns it's small okay then you are in this phase okay and at cert certain point here it's indicated by nb these two states have the same energy then you're entering to this phase and the more turns you make you're producing more and more loops and then there is a decrease of the extension because these two endpoints every time you add a loop you add minus 2 pi rc every time and then you're decreasing here when you when increase the number of turns uh, you're decreasing the the distance between these two endpoints so actually this this simple model predicts a straight line here of a fixed length and um, a straight line coming here the experiments are yeah you know as we have seen before this is not qu quite a straight line here it's it's slightly curved here but this is this is uh, roughly straight okay so the 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 theory predicts that if i calculate the slope here in this these are not this is, i'm not showing all all the calculations here and if i'm calculating the slope here this slope changes with the force okay so this is an experiment at one given force if i increase the force then i have another curve this slope uh, increases uh, as the force becomes smaller and the calculation here of this simple naive mechanical model gives a, uh, a behavior that uh, increases as one over the square root of, uh, of the force okay uh, the experiments actually are shown here and if I fit the experiments with the power law on the force I'm actually one gets an exponent which is quite close surprisingly quite close to this uh, to this simple uh, and naive mechanical model okay so this is a very 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 simple model of of, uh, of this super coiling transition so what happens and you, you have a, a filament and you start uh, rotating uh, here at the two ends uh, this just by by taking into account so the in this model I don't take any fluctuations into account I'm only looking at the ground state energy mm, you know it predicts uh, it's quite close uh, the reality okay so in the next lecture we will see more more sophisticated model and of course we are going to take fluctuations into account uh, but this is a, this is a nice uh, a nice uh, very simple naive model but uh, but already a nice uh, starting point